Hello, Halloween Time viewers. Today, we welcome series producer Rowan Crawford, who has been making specialist factual series and live television that highlights the nature world for 15 years. She was a senior producer on BBC's award-winning and long-running Natural World Strand and self-shooting director on the award-winning children's mockumentary, I've never heard of that word, series, The Zoo. Uh, CBBC. She is passionate about developing new talent and is actively involved in the drive to bring more on-screen diversity into the industry with series including Planet Defenders and her newest series, which we're here to talk about, called Big Catch 24-7, which airs on PBS here September 18th. Well, hi, Ron. Thank you for joining us on The Hollywood Times. Oh, hi, Judy. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's lovely to be here. And where are you dialing in from? Tell our viewers. I am joining you from Bristol in the United Kingdom, which is where the Natural History Unit is based. Uh, BBC Studios Natural History Unit has been based here for about 80 years. So this is my this is my home and this is where all of our great shows come from. Oh, what time is it there? It is 5 p.m. in the evening. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you. Nine o'clock here in L.A. and we're burning up with this heat wave. <laughs> it's yeah, we're. Cool. We're we're not, Judy. We're not. It's cold and a bit autumnal here already. So, um, yeah, we can't find a happy medium. Oh, send it to us. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, folks, I've watched a few of these episodes and uh, wow. You know, they, there are a lot of documentaries, a lot of films on animals and wildlife. But this one, you can tell there's some love and, and different ways of shooting. Um, as a producer of the Big Cats 24 seven, what was your responsibility to bring this series to television? So my role is really the overall kind of overarching um, series producer, which means I work with the executive producer and then the producers in the field to kind of bring the vision to life. Um, I do everything from, you know, talking through scripts and overseeing edits to being out in the field myself, helping to come up with a directal, directorial style um, and really just kind of being there from beginning to end, right the way through from, you know, inception to delivery um, to realise the vision um, for the commissioning parties. Uh, so we made the series with the BBC and with PBS. So my role is to kind of be their eyes and ears on the ground and make it happen. Woo, you wear a lot of hats. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so how was the cinematographers chosen for this series? Amazing. Yeah, um I mean fantastic uh sort of ensemble cast of cinematographers for this show. We're really proud of that and I think it's something that I'm really passionate about in my role in terms of tapping into experience but also tapping into new talent. Um so we worked really hard early on to decide where we wanted to film this series. Um mm -hmm. And that that led us to Botswana. Um, and in Botswana, we knew of Brad Besteling. We had previously worked with him um, on other series um, from Planet Earth 3 to The Natural World, which I worked on before, yeah. uh, long before this. And, um, and we had a great relationship with Brad and we knew that he had a really interesting setup where he basically develops in-country camera talent. Um, he gives them a fantastic opportunity to get their hands on equipment, get out into the field and really to flex their, their muscles as, as camera operators. Um, and at the same time, we wanted to blend that team with talent from the UK. Um, and further afield, we have Vianne Dejenge joining us from, from I mean, he's um, uh, half Congolese. Um, and we just really wanted to kind of represent as many different skills and as very many different talents as we could in the lineup of cinematographers to allow us to really understand the cats in a new way. And that's what we tried to do. Yeah. So tell our viewers what, what makes Big Cats 24-7 series different from other wild animal series? I think there's three main things that make the show different. I think one, which I've spoken about, is the new talent. It's yeah. it's tapping into talent in country in Botswana. We're, we're we're working with local cinematographers who know the landscape, they know the wildlife intimately and quite differently, maybe from cinematographers that we bring in. So Gordon Buchanan and Anna Dimitriadis and Vienna Dejenge come in with a fresh set of eyes, um, but they they face challenges themselves getting to understand the place and the cats. Um, so as a group, they kind of work together to to cover all bases. Um, 
And then I think we've really worked hard on the new technology that we've used, which makes the show different and gives us a different view of the cats. Um, there's been a really big development in nighttime filming technology in the last decade, um, you know, and it, it's really allowed us to step into their world and pull back the curtain in a way that maybe we haven't before. Um, and I think one of the things that we're really proud of in the show is how we've made that technology part of our story. Yes. So it's not just technology that we're using because it can do the job. It's actually part of the narrative of our show. Um, and that takes me to the third element that I think makes it different. And that's really telling natural history in a new way. So we are not coming at it from um, an objective point of view. We're immersing the cinematographers and hopefully the viewers in the cat's world. And that allows us to tell their story differently. Yeah. Were you there at all when they filmed in the dark? What's it like for the crew filming in the dark? I mean, to see it, I'm just like going, that's trippy. I mean, it's almost spooky, you know, the way yeah, they it is. It is really. I mean, you know, it's a very um, sensory um, driven experience. You work in the complete darkness. You need no light. You don't need ambient light from the moon. You can be in the pitch dark and you can turn that camera on and suddenly you're seeing the world around you. And it's quite um, disorientating at first because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you you look away and suddenly it's pitch dark. So mm -hmm. it's it's a really incredible experience. But I think it really gets you in touch with the the environment that you're working in, the sounds of the environment, as well as the scene that you see in front of you. Um, and you experience the Delta in a completely different way. So yes, it's it's a it's an extraordinary experience. I'm very glad we've been able to bring it to the screen. I wanna tell the viewers out there, when you record this, I mean, watch it live, but record it because you wanna go back. I kept going back and looking at those scenes again. I go, is that for real? Is that really a cat? It's so amazing to be able to watch it kind of over and over again, the night scenes. They're fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree, Judy. I think we, you know, I've been watching it a lot, as I'm yeah. sure you can imagine in my role. Yes. And um, and I tuned in on Sunday. The show has started to broadcast here in the UK. It was okay. episode three on last night. Um, um, and I, you know, I just loved watching it as much as I did the first time. And I, I never tire of, of of the scenes, but the the additional layer of that nighttime technology and that ability to follow the cats after dark, yeah, I think is what makes it quite compulsive viewing. It, it, it It's opening up that part of their lives we don't normally see, and it makes you want to go back and see more and more and more. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm one of those ones that's like, oh, I feel so bad for you know, you know, it's circle of life that they have to eat. So you feel bad for the, the mothers who have to feed themselves to feed their their cubs. And yet you feel sorry for the animal. And I didn't like to see that part. But I found myself intrigued in the series to kind of watch the kill and kind of because it just made me respect both sides of it, where before I only looked at one side, you know, the fact that that animal's dying, you know, but it, it for me, I've watched a lot because I love all this stuff. But this one made me appreciate it differently to where I could actually watch it you know I wanted to say that that's really that's really great to hear and I think that's a really interesting takeaway because it is it is not always easy to yeah. watch and it's not always easy to to document what happens in the in the natural world you know nature can be very brutal yeah. um, but it is also it is also important that we tell both sides of the story and it's also important I think that we represent it in a way that our audiences aren't put off by it because that yeah. is what happens in the natural world and it's important that we justify that by showing how hard it is for a lion to live in the delta or anywhere for that matter you know oh. it's really tough for them and you know they don't they don't succeed very often yeah. um we might assume <laughs> that they do but one in ten kills fail you know one in ten hunts are not successful uh um yeah. sorry one in ten hunts are successful so yeah. nine out of ten fail um so it's a really challenging life for them and and you know you think about lions and they live in a familial group and there's num a number of them it's hard for them and then you look at something like a leopard or a cheetah that lives alone and it's even harder for them so I'm glad that you took that away and I think it's important to show that to the viewers that it's not it's it's they're big cats but they live in a big bad world and it's tough for them out there. Yeah. Just that alone makes this an award-winning series to me because it's just amazing, you know. Oh. Well, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, Jenny. I really hope for so. For sure. Now, I I heard them say that the it was took 6 months of filming of this? I mean, what did it take to make that happen? Did, where did they stay? The crew? Um, 
tell us about that. I- I'm intrigued. <laughs> yeah. So we we um we teamed up, as I said, with Brad Bestelink from his his organization's called the Natural History Film Unit Botswana. And Brad has an amazing camp out there that's designed to film from. So okay. it's very simple. It's made entirely from recycled materials. Um but it is extraordinarily well thought out. So we have a big sort of central part of the um, camp that is like a mess tent all Mm -hmm. up on stilts. So everything is off the ground. So, you know, in case there's scorpions or snakes or things that might want to get into your room, everything's up on stilts. Um, So we have a big sort of communal area where we can all gather and eat together at night. And um, when people are in camp and have breakfast, if you're there early in the morning, everybody gathers there and has coffee at five in the morning. Um, And then... Alongside that, we have a sort of stack, as it were, of um, platforms. So there's three platforms that have little cabins, canvas cabins, again, lifted off the ground so that we can be safe from any animals that pass through. Um, And alongside that, we have some little cabins that we work in in the day. So people like me, if I'm not in the truck, I might be (laughs) in one of these cabins kind of looking at footage or on the radio asking them to get certain shots um, but it's a really well thought out camp and it's 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 right in the heart of our cats territory, okay. which means they come and go through the camp all the time. Um, and it makes it so um, visceral to be there because you're you're able to hear them at night, just padding under your under your cabin sometimes. Oh There'll be elephants, hyenas. Um, and, you, you know, it just becomes the norm. Um, and we would go out there for the main production team would travel out there for about seven weeks at a time. And then in between that, Brad's team of local operators would be based there to continue to follow the action so that we could have some breaks in and out of camp. Um, And that allowed us to really stick with the cats, which was great. I don't know whether I can mention this. We'll take it out if we have to. But I was very intrigued about the fire. How did the crew, you know, because this is real life, what you're filming, and then you've got... You know, we have wildland fires here right now where we're living. I've got one here. and But out there, and it just burns so fast. What did your crew do around that? It was very, very, like, heart throbbing to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was there at the time. And, um, you know, it was it was scary. You know, it was a scary experience for all of us. Um, but we were with Brad and his team. And they live, the, the camp is four hours from Mound. So it's right out in the bush. And it's, you know, it's really well equipped for yeah. such things happening, but it is like, you feel like you're far away, you know, you're far away from help. Yeah. Um, but they are incredibly experienced at handling fire in that landscape. So before it even happened, you know, Brad is managing the landscape. He 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 cuts fire breaks around the camp. You know, they're constantly monitoring to make sure that there isn't a risk that we're gonna, you know, wake up to a fire in the night, for example. Um, and that fire in particular was, big it was the biggest in five years Mm -hmm. and it traveled down through a dry floodplain so we were there the flood was late so the land was particularly dry Mm -hmm. um and it just gathered pace um and really you know we were able to see it coming the team were able to prepare we as a kind of crew maintained a sort of bubble right in the heart of camp and brad's team led the sort of firefighting um effort um, and it was thanks to their kind of experience and quick thinking that they were able to sort of get another break bill and divert it past the camp. Um, but it was it was scary. And it was um, it was a really big eye opener for all of us about how quickly things in the Delta can change. Um, yeah. And it was extraordinarily um, powerful to see what it then did to the landscape afterwards. You afterwards. know, it changed everything for all of us. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was it was something to be to be there and see. Um, but it was definitely not something that we planned. <laughs> yeah, I just it's just like, you know, and then there's another scene where one of the one of your cinematographers is a female, and you know, they're out there in their Jeep kind of looking thing, and you know, the, all of a sudden the big cats, lions come by, and it's just like, okay, that guy just walked by her and looked at her, and then the other one slowed down, and I could just I stopped breathing. I had anxiety because I'm like, I know it's film, you know, things can be edited, but still what she had to be going through. I mean, did you ever feel that when you're out there? The cats can get really close. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's an, it's a natural response for your blood to pump. Um, but I think what's really extor- extraordinary about working there is we've, we've really worked hard to 
work alongside Brad and his team and the way they work. And that is how they operate. They've been doing it for 20 years. Wow. They're, you know, experts in their field. Their trucks are open sided that, to allow you to be able to see all around you, which yeah. makes it safer, actually. Um, oh. And you're able to really uh, kind of immerse yourself in the place by being that close and in that proximity. But yeah. it's absolutely at the cat's kind of accordance. So we we have a very strict rule, and that is that we are always in a buddy system where there's two trucks working in the vicinity of each other so that if somebody does feel that they're in trouble or they get stuck, say, and they need help, you know, you'll have seen that in one of the episodes where Greg helps Anna out of a hole. But that, yeah. that, that also allows them to predict or to look at cats and say, right, these cats are maybe a little bit more skittish or these cats are behaving in a way that I'm not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And then you give them a wider berth. Um, in the instance with Anna, where, where the two intruder males came close, yeah. they they chose to come towards her. And, and really, whilst it feels really counterintuitive, the right thing to do in that situation is to be very still, to yeah. be very calm, not to make any sudden movements and let them pass because they're living their lives. They weren't doing anything that was exhibiting threatening behavior. Yeah. Um, and that allowed her to, you know, she just, you know, you hear her saying, stay calm, stay calm. But she did it. She was really yeah. calm. She behaved the way she should. And that was all, you know, we, we took a lot of time before we went out there to risk assess and to take advice from Brad and his team and other line experts about how to behave. Mm -hmm. And it really served us well. And, and that's why the cats can get close. And that's why we can work this way without the need for rifles or panic or the sense that it's unsafe. It's actually we all go out there knowing what we should and shouldn't do. And if you follow those rules, you'll be fine. Yeah. So, you know, six episodes, six months. Did it take a month per episode? How how do you put that all together? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a challenge. We we've we um yeah, it probably in filming terms, crudely, two to four weeks per episode may well be sort of crunched in in some ways, okay. if you sort of think about the passage of time. Okay. Um sometimes more and sometimes less, because sometimes the episodes are driven by really immediate action that's happening. Yeah. Um and then, yeah, we spent the winter. So we finished filming last sort of late October, early November last year. And then we spent the winter in the edit. So another six months working in the edit with the material and a number of different editors and producers to bring it all together and to create the series. Um, and that was a great experience because one of the best parts of my job is seeing the footage that, you know, yeah. these amazing cinematographers have captured and seeing it turn into a programme but it's been thrilling to see this series evolve because it's a little bit of everything. It's observational. It's a bit like a soap opera. You know, there's some extraordinary premium behavior led natural history. It's all the best bits in one show. Yeah. And, um, and I'm really proud of that, but I also really enjoyed working on it because of that. Yeah, it is extraordinary. I tell you, um, as a little girl, what did you want to do when you grew up? I wanted to either be a journalist or a lawyer. What? And... <laughs> <laughs> wow okay yeah very different and I I went into journalism I started out my career um I did an English literature degree and I went into journalism and when I went for my first job mm -hmm. I applied for a magazine journalist job at a Scottish publisher quite a famous publisher and they said no we don't think you're suitable for this this magazine job we'd really like you to work in our fiction department and I said oh I'd never thought about working in fiction and they said we think you've got a vivid imagination we think you'd be really good in fiction wow. and that was how I got I started I started writing children's fiction comic books and wow. um, long-form stories um, all based in the natural world so all based around kind of kids doing outdoor activities and things like that and I had always had a passion for wildlife myself. My I was brought up on a farm. I live in a small island on the west coast of Scotland. And so as time went on, I, I kind of slowly moved my way towards television. And then the Natural History Unit was a big draw for me because it had been a, a sort of ambition of mine for years to, to work there. And I was very lucky and fortunate to get in. Well, so growing up in that small island on the farm, what was your favorite animal and why? I think my favorite animal was a donkey called Neddy. It's very specific. <laughs> um, he was my favorite animal when I was uh, when I was growing up, um, mainly because he had a really bad temper and he had a real, 
you know, character. He was really characterful, you know. He he was a per he had a personality. And I love that about him. Um, and I think that's what I love now is really looking when we film our characters in the field, you know, you can take one view of being very objective and, and looking at them from a scientific perspective. Yes. But without anthropomorphizing, you can't help but want to understand their motivations and what it is that drives them and their family structure. And that, I think, brings out character. And, and that's what I love about the cats in our series, because we're really driven by their characters. But I think that's that's a part of being a storyteller as well, maybe. Yeah. Do you have a, did you have a favorite big cats character? Because they're all named. Did you have one that was your, you fell in love with? I, I did actually. Um, I fell in love with Metsy the leopard, the, me the young male leopard. Mm -hmm. Um, I think again he was cheeky. You know, we see him, <laughs> and, and you may or may not have watched this episode yet, Judy, but we see him in the series. He sort of comes in. He doesn't have a major role to play in our Kudum narrative because she she's just got this extraordinary storyline and this story arc across the series. Mm -hmm. But he comes in and he he looks like he may be a threat. But the thing I love most about him is that he shows a real intelligence when he tricks another male in order to get an easy meal. And it it just really tickled me. It was just, I just thought it was such an amazing example of foresight and intelligence in in deci and decision making. And it, it really impressed me. So he was my favorite. Yes. And I really uh, fell in love with the cheetah. It's such a magnificent looking animal. And the fact that that animal can run so fast I, I just like god gave him that speed the tree jumping behavior that we saw i think it was the leopards we see that in and that okay. the, the the tree jumping is i mean it is a phenomenal skill yeah. and you're absolutely right about them hurting themselves it, it's a really dangerous method yeah um, and it, it, it the okavango is one of the only places that we know this this behavior happens okay. it's possible it happens elsewhere but it's not been documented widely anywhere else. And um, it's it's really phenomenal if you're there and watch it because, I mean, to see the precision, you know, those, those impala have great big horns and they yes. have to be incredibly precise to not end up impaling themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And it can happen. They can be injured and it can, you know, one wrong footing and they, it can go wrong and they can end up in trouble. And um, we were really fortunate to, to not see that happen in the time we were there. And, it was wonderful to see Kudum, the leopard, our female that we were following, yeah. really hone the skill over the time we were there, which is another great part of the, the way we've made the show is being able to immerse ourselves for that six month period has really allowed us to follow the milestones of those cats. And, and, and that was what was really great about her story was seeing her learning and growing and developing as a cat along the way it was fascinating. And I like the scene where they're in the camp and then that big elephant, it's like the things and the guy's out there by himself, go, go away. And I'm like, is he crazy? He's just telling his elephant to go away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, he was a regular visitor, that bull elephant. And, um, <laughs> and we all became very fond of him, but you know, you have to treat them with respect. They are <laughs> large animals and they, they mean absolutely no malice or, or harm. One eat. But, <laughs> yeah. They're just so big, you know, they yeah. just, they don't know their own size. And, um, and and Greg, who sort of sent him away, um, and Brad had also sort of told us this about the visiting elephants. You just have to be very firm with them. They're very intelligent, you know. And if you're firm and you say no, this is not happening, they okay. they understand. And you know, after that happened, we didn't see him for days. He obviously wow. went away, and he was um he was he was feeling a little bit sheepish about his bad behavior. But he came back and um and and he was was you know was was never a badly behaved again really he would pass through but he wasn't pulling branches down or causing problems so he learned from that experience. Oh, so what do you want our viewers to take away from this show? I really want our viewers to have a deeper understanding of the complexities of big cat life. Mm -hmm. I think we show a whole myriad of of characteristics and personalities in this series and i think you know it's it's one thing to imagine them as being big fierce predators but actually big cats have extraordinary lives that are really layered like like us like humans and i want people to really take that away from the series and and really cherish them as a species because they're not doing well globally you know their numbers are in decline mm -hmm. and we are fortunate to be able to bring viewers a snapshot of what it's like to live in a place untouched by man most for the most part and where lions and cheetahs and leopards are doing well 
that in a lot of other parts of Africa and other parts of the world, they are not doing well. And I really want people to watch the show, connect with them as individuals and love them. If you love something, then you're more likely to care about it and protect it for the future. Yeah. Does Big Cats 24-7 have a social media? And do you have one as well? So Big Cats 24-7, you can follow along via BBC Studios, BBC Earth hashtags, and also via the Big Cats 24-7 Uh, hashtag itself and Big Cats PBS. Um, all hashtags are available. Um, and you can find me on Instagram. You know, I'm just Rowan Crawford. I'm out there. I'm easy to find. Um, please follow along. So all of our viewers, it's going to be here at PBS station September 18th, and you can't miss it. And if I had a DVR, I'd record it, but I don't. But I'll be watching it again anyways. <laughs> So we do appreciate you taking the time to uh, dial in from across the, what do they call that? Across the pond? Is that what they always say? That's right. <laughs> it was my pleasure, Judy. Thanks for having me. Yes. And we will actually be putting this up on our uh, official YouTube channel, Hollywood Times official. So we'll have that. So if you want it for any kind of social media, but we do appreciate you taking the time with us. That's brilliant. Thanks so much. Really nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you.